name is Jean Easton, and I live in Kentucky. And um, my testimony is uh, an antique testimony. It goes back to 1900 when my grandfather was baptized into the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, he was a Methodist, a, a respected farmer in the community. And, you know, back in those days, every, especially in little small towns, everybody knew everything about everyone else. And uh, he was hearing some talk about his brother-in-law losing his mind. Uh, his brother-in-law was a very intelligent and good Christian, so he was concerned about him. So he got on his horse and rode over to see. Yeah, on his horse. This is the, even before T. Model Ford came along. And the organization was only about 25 years old at this time. Uh, anyhow, he rode uh, over to talk to his brother-in-law and learned that he had a set of uh, studies of the scriptures written by Charles Taze Russell. And uh, indeed, these uh, books were describing things of the Bible would be quite different from any of those folk that had ever learned or heard of in their life. So Grandpa uh, took the books home and he started reading them. He started looking at the scriptures and he became convinced that they had the truth. He liked the idea that uh, there was not a, such a place as a burning hell where people would be tortured the rest of their uh, throughout all eternity. He liked the idea that everyone who had ever lived would be resurrected. Everyone from Adam and Eve forward would be resurrected, taught the truth in God's new world of righteousness, and then judged as to whether or not they would have eternal life. Oh yes, this was a teaching back then. He liked the idea that the end was coming in 1914. And shortly thereafter, uh, God's new, God's earthly phase of the kingdom would begin. Uh, at that time, they taught that 18 and 74 was the time when Christ was enthroned as king in heaven. So that is a big change uh, from what they taught later on. Of course, when 1914 came, Armageddon didn't come, and the earthly phase of the kingdom did not arrive. Then they gradually, over a period of a number of years later, they dropped the 18 and 74 date, and then said that Christ was enthroned in heaven in 1914, and that was the beginning of the end. And so my grandfather uh, continued in the organization and taking the books from house to house and teaching his family these things. And, uh, of course, my mother, uh, being uh, his daughter, uh, heard about all these things. And I guess you could call his home a little kingdom hall. Uh, in those days, the witnesses taught that uh, the... Um, it was wrong to build any kind of building to meet in. For, uh, it was in the homes where the early Christians met, which is true, of course. And so, therefore, that all meetings were to be held in the homes. And, of course, when people began to outgrow their homes, then this was changed, too, later on. You see, when things don't come true, what's expected, uh, they have to get new life and change their their uh, their belief. Um, my husband was raised Catholic, and um, when I became uh, a teenager and started uh, thinking about courting, there weren't any eligible uh, Jehovah's Witness boys in our kingdom hall. We had a very small kingdom hall in Lexington, Kentucky at that time. And so when my husband returned from the war, by the way, we were childhood sweethearts, lived close to, uh, close by, lived on the next street over. And so when he returned from World War II, we got married. And uh, a year later, when we uh, were expecting our first son, we decided that we needed to know what we were going to teach him. My husband was an easy, easy prey to win to Jehovah's Witnesses because most Catholics don't read their Bibles and... Uh, I had uh, one of the elders in the congregation to come to our house so Bill could learn the truth. And um, it wasn't long then after that till 
he was dedicated his life thinking he was dedicating his life to Jehovah. Um, we became very active attending all the meetings and going out in service and taking our little son and Bill's Catholic family I look back I don't know how they put up with us I really don't but in their loving way uh, they accepted us for for who we were And, and you know that's really and truly God's way of love is unconditional love and they certainly showed us that uh, when, I remember one time when our son was around four years old, we went over to the house at Christmas time, and uh, the, the grandmother and his grandmother and mother said, uh, "Come into the living room, let us show show you the pretty tree." And uh, it was all decorated, and our little son went in there with him. Of course, we didn't go in there with him, and uh, he looked at it and he said, uh, "Our little son said Jehovah doesn't like." A Christmas tree and he says I don't either and he turned and walked out and of course we praised him to high heaven for taking his stand for Jehovah uh, I look back now and you know I think about little children and um, how they will accept whatever they're taught and I think about the poor little radical Muslim children who are taught that it's pleasing to their God, Allah, to strap on a bomb and go in and blow people up. This is pleasing to God. And, and uh, it, you know, just if you have children, be careful how you teach them. Um, we went for ten years before we had other children because this was during the time that the Watchtower Society was talking about how near Armageddon is and according to them you know Armageddon is always right at your doorstep and uh, it was best to refrain from having children and and then they got a turnaround and said to start talking about the blessings of having children and all of a sudden you start seeing on the front covers of the watch tire and await the blessings of having little children and uh, I guess somebody figured out up there that hey this is a good way to increase the growth of our organization and so all of a sudden you saw all these pregnant women going around and so that was a blessing that's an add-on I'm glad they had uh, because we added two children to our family uh, I was uh, RH negative factor blood and uh, in those days uh, the only thing that they could do if a child was born with a problem uh, uh, the, with the blood, the only thing they cho- they had knowledge of was to drain all their blood out, put new blood in. So, being a faithful Jehovah Witness, dedicated person that I was, I, I I followed their instructions and discussed with my doctor that I could not take blood, nor could my baby under any any condition. And I can't tell you how I felt those nine months. I was so worried. I was so concerned. And in my mind, I kept going over and over. Could I do it? Could I be faithful to Jehovah if my baby had to have a transfusion? Could I be willing to let that child die? And I told myself, yes, I could because I love Jehovah with all my heart, soul, and mind. And if I did not uh, let that child die, if I didn't indeed, and I did give it blood, then I would lose my life and could not have eternal life in God's righteous new world, nor could my child. So I was ready to allow that happen, and I am so thankful that neither one of my children had that problem but there, there were others that did, and we read about it all the time, of how that the state would take uh, control of, it, of uh, the, that child and give it blood and, and then give it back to its parents. And I've heard a lot of Jehovah's Witness parents say how thankful they were that that, that happened. Of course, now you see uh, the Watchtower society's got a lot of new light on the blood and now you can take blood factions and it's always so very complicated but I, I, I think a change is on the way about this blood transfusion 
And this is what is so dangerous about this organization. Because once you come to believe that you have dedicated your life to Jehovah and that the organization is his faithful and discreet slave class who will give you meat in due season, that means who will give you what they say is the truth of the Bible. It's really a bunch of men who's sitting up there in Brooklyn. It's really their interpretation of the Bible, which I now understand fully. But uh, if you believe that you have the truth, then you're going to follow all their commands and do what they say because you feel like if you don't, you're not going to have an opportunity to live forever in God's new world. And so, believe it or not, this will sound real strange to you all because uh, this is not a teaching today, but a teaching back then. When one watchtower or wait came out and said... uh, You should go to your grocer and ask them if they have drained their meat properly. Because if you don't, and they haven't, then you're taking in blood. You're eating blood. Oh, my goodness. I'll never forget how silly I felt when the grocer said, Well, do you think we could possibly put blood out in in our meat, have blood in our meat and put it out in the meat counter? Well, my goodness, no. It would be contaminated. We couldn't do that. I felt so silly, but I was being obedient. Um, Also, uh, about that time, this bothered me. This is the beginning of making me think for myself. Uh, They came out with um, the fact that if you saw anyone in the congregation committing a sin, that if you don't report them, it's the same as you're committing it yourself. And one of the sisters in the congregation uh, had a baby, and she took a blood transfusion. Someone in my neighborhood told me about it. I wrestled with this. It bothered my conscience to go and report her. I did go to her first and found out it was true, and it bothered my conscience something terrible to report her. But yet it bothered my conscience as I didn't do it because then that's the same as the sin falling on me. So being the faithful, dedicated Jehovah's Witness I was, I went to the uh, committee and reported her and they called her in and put her on probation. Oh, I'll never forget how terrible that was. But you know what? Now she's out of the organization too and she loves the true person of uh, God and His Son Jesus Christ, and and she knows what the true gospel is now, and I'm thankful for that. So, uh, a few years on beyond that, as these doubts grew, and I kept putting them on the shelf, more and more doubts came along, and more and more things went on my shelf, and one day they began to break down. And this is when that I inherited this literature a while ago that I mentioned that my grandpa had. He had the entire Watchtower Library. And uh, I inherited an entire library. They gave it to me, and I decided I would look through some of the publications before storing them in the attic. Well, as I read and I read and I read, I could see how many times the Watchtower leaders had changed their interpretation of Scripture. And the Scripture in my mind kept ringing out, I, Jehovah, change not. And I thought, well, if Jehovah does not change, then how could interpretation of His Word change? And as I read the modern, the current publications, and I saw they would quote in certain older publications making statements like, as far back as 1914 we saw, or we said. And I thought, hmm, I had that book that they were quoting from. So I opened it up and I read it. And believe me, people, the older publication was not saying at all of what the modern publication said. 
that it was perfect. Oh, I'm telling you what's true. This opened my eyes. I thought, well, I could understand people getting new light if they didn't understand something in the past and they understand something better now and, and they would make it made, made known through the Watchtower publications. I could understand that. But now wait a minute. When these publications are being written and they're quoting from those older publications, they know what they're saying and what they're not saying. So this is deliberate deception, especially when they misquote it. I started, got me a big, thick notebook, and I started making notations of all of those books I was reading. I read, I think I read just about every one of them up to the current publications. And after I had a thick notebook, I thought, what am I going to do? I cannot raise these younger children. The older child was already grown by now, but I could not raise these younger children to believe these things. I can't tell you how devastated I was. I sent the notebook off to the brothers at the headquarters. I thought maybe they could say something to make all this go away. Maybe they can write and tell me something that's going to make me feel all better. But they didn't. They wrote back pages to me trying to explain it away. But it didn't help. I made a decision, and it took me two years, by the way, to make this decision while I was doing all this research. I realized I had studied my way out of the organization, and I felt like a man without a country. I felt so alone. I thought, I haven't left Jehovah God. I still love Him. And I still love His Son, Jesus Christ, and I still love His Word. So I need to find the truth. The churches don't have it. They're all false. So who does have it? Maybe somebody that is similar to their organization has the truth. Hmm. I heard about the Donites. I had some of their publications, in fact, among that literature that I inherited. Because I remember Grandpa, see, he was, uh, he, I mean, uh, Grandpa and I was real close. I mean, Grandpa didn't, he didn't die until he was 96, and I was grown and had children. And after he'd lost his eyesight and he wasn't keeping up with the organization, he was still holding on to some of the older beliefs. And we had lots of discussions. And my mother and he would go round and round and round debating the old teachings compared to the new teachings. And I sometimes felt like a lot that helped me to become a thinker of my own self. And I remember when... Um, he was ill and he had to go to the hospital and my mother was worried that he would not take his stand against a blood transfusion and he was not convinced at all that the Bible said that you should not take a blood transfusion. And He had me to, to write to the society and, and ask them about that and whether one would be disfellowship for taking a blood transfusion. And They wrote back and said, no, you would not be disfellowshipped for taking a blood transfusion that was not considered to be a sin like adultery and a drunkenness and so forth and you know what just a couple of years later that changed and they said yes you would be this fellowship for taking a blood transfusion oh my my so uh, the doll nights <laughs> that led me to uh, seeking out uh, the plain truth magazines uh, Mormonism, all of those other people who did not have the true gospel. You see, I was trying to identify still with the false gospel. Praise the Lord, after 15 years of being in spiritual wilderness. And all of those 15 years, I kept reading the Bible, but I still had on my watchtower glasses. 
I wasn't understanding, but I was praying and I was seeking. And Bill's sister, Bill's faithful Christian sister, was praying for us. And I, by the way, I decided to start going to church. I thought, well, if the Watchtower Society doesn't really have the truth, maybe what they said about all the churches being so false, Maybe that's not true either. Maybe they're not all that false. So that's just, Bill, I talked my husband into going to a church. I said, Bill, let's just go over and sit and listen and and see what they're about. So we began to go and sit and listen. And lo and behold, some dear watchtower people, some of my faithful dear Jehovah's Witness friends saw us going into the church and they reported us because when we first start attending the Watchtower Society was saying they only disfellowshipped you if you got baptized into another church but now all that changed big changes was happening Watchtower headquarters Ray Franz was leaving who was on the governing body, was leaving the organization. They had to set an example before everybody and started disfellowshipping people right and left for even talking to one who had left and taken their stand. And we got caught up into that too. And so we had to appear before a committee and they told us if we didn't stop going to church that we would be disfellowshipped and of course that would mean we would be cut off from my parents and uh, my precious parents were getting in their years now at that time you see I was still searching I was not convinced when we were called on the carpet whether the churches were true or false whether they were of God or of Satan And so we yielded to their commands and just stopped attending church. Again, I was in spiritual loneliness, spiritual never-never land. I found more, more of my comfort by reading Proverbs. It really spoke to my heart, and I read that to my children a lot. And they turned out to be very wise children in their grown up years and they still are and I'm thankful that I did not stop from reading the Bible at least to my children and did not stop telling them that the importance of believing in God I didn't know for sure who he was but I did believe in him and you know what every time we went on vacation (laughs) we would go to church Uh, We wouldn't get caught then. So after those 15 years went by, um, my sister-in-law, and by the way, she was Catholic, but she was a born-again Catholic. Now whatever that might mean to a lot of people, it spoke to my heart because for the first time I saw her reading her Bible I heard her talking about Jesus, how she loved him. I saw her stop smoking. I saw her stop drinking. I saw her start praising God and teaching children the love of God. And I knew she had something that I wanted. But I wasn't sure what it was. But when she invited me to a special meeting at her Catholic church. Now I want to tell you folks, I know there's a lot of people that have a lot to say about a lot of denominations, but let me tell you something. God can speak to your heart anywhere at any time that He chooses. And no man and no woman and no person can stop that. So she invited me to this meeting in the basement of a Catholic church and she said 
that this priest was a born-again priest who traveled from church to church, Protestant and Catholic, speaking about the love of God. Now, I thought she was caught up into something strange, and I thought I might have to straighten her out. So I went out of curiosity, and I invited a teacher friend of mine, and we sat in the back and to the, on the aisle so that I could jump up and run out if I wanted to. Now, I remember I was told I would be disfellowshipped if I went to church. So I looked around and hoping no Jehovah's Witnesses would see me dart into that church. And so in I went. My teacher friend and I, we sat on the back. We listened to this priest. <laughs> Boy, I never heard anything what I heard that night because I heard a love message of Christ. I heard a salvation message. I heard a true gospel preached that I never heard before. And I was listening. And when he finished speaking, he said, I want everyone to stand and hold hands and we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer. When we started singing the Lord's Prayer, I something happened to me that I was not expecting. You see, I'd been praying for truth. I'd been looking for the truth. I didn't know what an experience of the Holy Spirit was, but I experienced it. The power of God started pouring over me. It just felt like liquid love was penetrating every fiber of my body. It went to the inner part most of my soul. And instantly, without anyone saying one word to me, instantly I knew that the truth was Jesus Christ. You see, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come to the Father except by me. And I thought to myself, I have been looking for truth through doctrines. Who has the truth? What is the new heavens and the new earth? What is the definition of hell? What is the definition of soul? What is the de definition of trinity? See, you know how it is when you're Jehovah's Witness. That's the truth. Understanding those doctrines as interpreted by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And Jesus said, He was the truth. Oh, I was so filled with his love that when I left that place that night, I was so joyful when I got in the car, I just started laughing out loud. You know, people, when you hunger for truth and you find the real truth, you will be joyful. You really will. And my teacher friend said, something must have happened to you back there. And I said, you know, it did. I don't know what exactly what happened. But I am filled with God's love. And I know what the truth is now. It's not what, it's who the truth is. It's Jesus Christ. And He is the answer. It's not the doctrines, uh, certain doctrines, that save you is Jesus and his precious blood that he shed who saves you. Well, when I got home that night, see, my husband wouldn't go with me. He was fed up with religion by this time. He didn't want anything to do with any religion. And he, when I came in and he said I was church, and I just started laughing. He said, you all didn't go to church, did you? He couldn't believe that anybody could go to church and come home that joyful. Well, folks, in the days to follow, I thought this would wear off. This newfound joy would leave me. But I got up every morning praying, inviting Jesus Christ into my heart. I started talking to God like I knew Him. And I says, God... I want all you have for me. 
I don't know if I'm supposed to call you Jehovah or not, but who, whoever you are, God, I know you're my Father. And I know that you sent your Son, Jesus, to this earth to die for me. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I want all that you have for me. Lord, I want your will. I want your will in my life. Forgive me of all my sins. And help me to follow you the rest of my days. Show me how to follow you, Almighty God. When I prayed that prayer, I felt a peace and joy in my heart that I knew he would never forsake me and he would never leave me. And that was the beginning of my walk with him. In the days to come, all kinds of things and doors start opening up of opportunities. And I found myself saying, Yes, Lord, I did tell you I wanted to know your will. And if it's your will for me to write this book that you're putting it on my heart, where that all of this research I've done along with my testimony will come to light, that will reach out and help others, I will obey. And you know what, folks? I was working as a reading and math tutor at that time, six hours a day. And you know what? The Lord would wake me up at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning with these words flowing through my mind of, of this book of what to write. I'd never written anything in my life. Didn't know how to write anything. But I wrote what was coming to me, and that's how that book came to life. And I wasn't too tired to go to work the next day. He strengthened me. And when I, John Ankerberg called and asked me to come and be on television with Joan Centenar and Helen Ortega and Lori McGregor. All these people have ministries now and they appeared on the television, national TV. To, to we, we wanted people to know our stories. And you wouldn't believe how we were flooded, each and every one of us. Our mailboxes were jammed with people asking questions about what we believed. And I became a discipler overnight, writing to all these people. After I put in my six hours a day, I'd come home and spend hours and hours and hours writing to folks. And the Lord set up a network program through our ministry of, of uh, putting these people in touch with others so that they could all have personal contact. From there, the Lord put it on our hearts to have some seminars in the, in the churches um, and uh, to help people understand the difference in the true and the false gospel. And many people have been blessed by that. Now, the day did come when we were seen, you know, going to church because my husband and I believe strongly that to be spiritually healthy, you need to be connected into a Bible-believing church where that you can have fellowship and be nurtured in the Word of God. But we were seen going to church. By this time, I felt like we had to go regardless of what might happen to us. I knew we would be disfellowshipped, and we were. And would you believe that a knock came on our door and one of my favorite old Jehovah's Witness friends of the past and another younger J.W. came in and sat down on her couch and he said, Now, Jean, he said, Is this true what we hear that you're going to church? And I said, Oh, yes, and let me tell you about it. It is so wonderful. I began to share with him what had happened to me and what Christ had done in my life. And he said, no, you know, Jean, just because we're friends of the past doesn't mean that you won't be disfellowshipped. And I said, I know that what you're doing now, that you're doing because you think you're being obedient to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And I want you to know that when the day comes that they change this, and they probably will, that I want you to know for what you're doing right now, I'm going to forgive you for it. Because what you're doing right now, you're going to cause 
all Jehovah's Witnesses to ignore me and never speak to me again. And I said, I want you to know that I forgive you if the day comes that they change all this. And you know what? That day did come. They did change that. Because a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses began suing the Watchtower Society because they would not announce before the congregation that they were being disfellowshipped for going to another church. No. They would disfellowship them by saying, for conduct on becoming a Christian. And you see, that left folk thinking that they had done something wrong, like, you know, committing a terrible sin, like being a drunkard or committing adultery or something horrible like that. So they started, many Jehovah's Witnesses started suing the Watchtower Society, and so they got new light, dear friends, and they stopped the formal of what they did to me, going and knocking on somebody's door and disfellowshipping them for going to another church. And instead they would say, well, so-and-so has disassociated themselves by the course of action that they have taken. But, dear friends, let me tell you something. They still expected you to shun them and not speak to them ever again. And we ministered to so many hurting families who had been cut off from their folk. But gradually that started changing. (laughs) And people started associating with family members. They stopped disfellowshipping for going to another church and instead changed that to like, well, if you associate with apostate, if you became an apostate, start speaking out against the organization then you could be disfellowshipped. But now, since all this child molestation has come forth and the cover-ups in all the kingdom halls, um, they once again want to protect people from finding all those things out. And I understand that disfellowshipping is being revived. Who knows? But you know what? Pray for those that's in the leaders in the Watchtower Society. We need to pray for them every day that they will come to know the real truth, that it would start seeping out into the Watchtower literature, and that people would start picking up and finding the real truth. Most recent thing I've heard is that there are a numer- numerous people who are coming forth who are Jehovah's Witnesses, who are claiming to be born again, who are claiming to be of the 144,000. As you know, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe anybody can be born again unless they are the 144,000. And these are supposed to be all died out, you see. Uh, There's only supposed to be seven or 8,000 of them left. And now that number is increasing instead of decreasing. And this is upsetting their theology. And uh, we met some people at the Pennsylvania Convention just this last October. And um, uh, they uh, they told us that a lot of people are getting new light in the organization now because uh, there's many stepping forth. You know what I think is happening? I think they're having a Holy Spirit experience just like I had. Now, does everyone have to have a Holy Spirit experience? experience like I had to be saved or come to know Jesus? Absolutely not. Some people grow very gradually into a love relationship of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Some people, God reaches people in whatever way He chooses. But if you're hungry for the truth and you start asking and you start seeking, you will find the truth. My book is called A Jehovah's Witness Finds the Truth. Uh, You'd have to get it through one of the ministries. You could get it through Lori McGregor's ministry, uh, Randy Waters' ministry. You could write to me. Jean Easton 
467 Sandalwood Drive, Lexington, Kentucky, 40505, and I can mail you one. So may the Lord guide and bless you in all your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.